Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, today's edition of Live Since You Asked. Uh, this week, as we begin uh, Alumni Mentoring Week for the PrEP community, we welcome students and alums, and we're very fortunate to have with us uh, Mike Angelakis of the class of 1982. He is the chairman and chief, chief executive officer of Ataros and also the former uh, CFO at Comcast. Mike, thanks for being with us today. Happy to be with you guys. Sorry we couldn't do this in person. Yeah, it would have been it would have been nice to see you in person, but uh, the, the world had other plans for us. Um, and as I've shared with Mike, um, you know, we're gonna have, we have a few questions that we'll ask Mike that we've prepared, and then for our students and alumni that are that are tuned in, uh, if you use the questions feature over on the the right hand side, if you're on a desktop, just type type your question in, it'll get to us. If you're on a um, iPhone or a smartphone or a tablet, there's a little question mark at the top of the screen, and you can click that and submit your question to us. So, Mike, uh, you've, you've had a, a wonderful uh, career in, in, in many different ways and, and graduated from St. John's in 1982. Can you talk a little bit how about how uh, St. John's has been a, an influence for you and, and something that's that stayed with you since you graduated and, and how the prep has impacted you in your, in your, in your journey? Uh, sure. Um, you know, I went to all four years at the prep. I grew up in Peabody, Mass, and, um, you know, I had a great experience at the prep. I really did. I would say that uh, I still have, you know, many lifelong friends that are from the prep. In fact, a week or so ago, four of us had a Zoom, you know, touch base and see how folks are. And um, I, I think where the prep is unique compared to maybe some other schools and whether when I was young and thinking about what high school I wanted to go to or I see my kids or friends' kids, I think the prep actually not only is a great place to get educated and learn a lot and think about you know, college going forward, and I call that sort of focusing on the head, but I think the prep actually has a really nice way of focusing on the heart too, and community and so forth, and you know, that nice balance of between the head and the heart, I think really influenced me a, a bit when I was younger, and hopefully you know, developed some of my core values and core elements of my personality. So I, I think the prep is a unique place, and, even though I don't live in Massachusetts and I haven't been there for a long time, it's still close to me. It's great to hear that you're you're still connecting and Zoom meetings are still happening with a with a bunch of your uh, with your with your classmates. Oh, yeah. um, you've been in, involved in a in a in, in leadership, you know, especially in your work today um, and, and the work you've done in the past. And uh, you just talked a little bit um, about kind of how St. John's informed your core values. Can, one of our panelists, a uh, uh, a few weeks ago talked about the a crisis in leadership right now can you talk about the the importance of of having kind of a, a value-centered leadership and the importance of strong leadership in the midst of kind of the challenging times that we're in right now or or just even in the, in the work that you've done uh, and are doing yeah th there's just no substitute for great leadership um you know the character of the people the core values the inspirational aspects the quality of the talent and so forth the decisiveness, um, there's just no, there's no substitute for that at all. And how, whether they lead organizations or whether they lead schools or whether they lead, you know, businesses or government. And, you know, and particularly in times like this, you actually get to see what I call the metal of, uh, of leaders in terms of how good they really are in inspiring the communities and the organizations they manage. Um, and, you know, really, really great leaders tend to shine during these hard times. It's pretty good when things are easy to be perceived as a good leader. When things are hard and difficult, that's when I think you really, you know, see how the individuals perform as leaders. And, you know, we have lots of examples around the world today where I think there's tremendous lack of leadership and we have others where uh, you're seeing people rise to the top and, and certainly help uh, navigate the crisis we're in. It's, you know, one of the, um, when we've done some some reading and, and research, Mike, about the work that you've done at Comcast, one of the, the leadership roles we, you've played is kind of helping um, Com Comcast transform um, into into a media and tech company that it is. And, and while you serve um, as the vice chairman and CFO, you're still connected to the company. Can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, your, your work with Comcast? I mean, everybody, a lot of us see it as this, this big giant corporation out there, but Maybe just give us a sense of, of what happens on the inside and, and the importance of the, the different roles that, that you've played and what it was like to be part of a, such a massive organization. Yeah, um, you know, it, it's it's a massive organization, maybe approaching 300,000 employees, so wow. pretty big, a pretty big company. 
you know, the reality is these are just numbers though. You know, if you're managing a company that is 30 or 300 or 300,000, you know, the zeros on it just change. Uh, whether the zeros are employees or their financial aspects in some of the core aspects of the same though. You know, again, we just talked about leadership and strategy and financial discipline and things that are really important in how one uh, develops an organization culturally and how you acquire talent and all those kinds of things are just critically important. Uh, when I joined Comcast, Comcast had a strategy for, you know, maybe a decade or so that frankly just was running out of steam. And um, we had to put together a new strategy uh, and recognize really a couple things. If we wanted to be a leader in the media technology field, Number one, we needed more scale and we needed to diversify into certain areas where we really were subscale. Um, we looked at a whole variety of, of areas, um, international, um, wireless uh, content, and decided that we would put a strategy together to garner scale in each of those areas. And over the period of time that, we, that I was there, uh, it was a great experience to, you know, what I call play offense. And, and help build the company and strategically figure out how you develop it. And we ended up buying NBC Universal, which you know NBC and Universal Studios and Universal theme parks and going on and on and on. Lots of cable channels, USA and the Golf Channel and so forth, all were part of NBC at the time. And we integrated that within Comcast. Um, most recently, Comcast bought a large European um, media technology company. And then we struck a deal with uh, with Verizon to offer wireless services to our Comcast customers. So over you know 15 years or so, none of this happens overnight. Uh, Comcast really developed from a regional cable company to today you know a multinational with you know well over 100 billion dollars of revenue and almost 300,000 of employees in you know operations in China all over the world. Uh, and that was an exciting thing to be part of. You know, frankly, a lot, a lot of work. This is a seven day a week job. Um, sure. But I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And the people who I worked with were um, were just fantastic. And, you know, at a point in time, you have to decide whether you want to keep doing this and commit for another 10 years or so. That's kind of how I look at, look at it. And I felt that given my age and things, I preferred to look at some other things and be a little bit more entrepreneurial. So I'm still very close to the Comcast team. Uh, a lot of members have have turned over because what happens in large companies is new people come in and you really want to give them their shot at leading the company. And uh, I was very happy to uh, move and do something a little bit different. That's awesome. It must be a, a very gratifying to be a part of something that, that is kind of really sustained and energized such a, such a big entity and, and 300,000 employees makes me feel kind of uh, less nervous about the 260 that we're trying to lead through St. John's right now. Um, yeah, I mean, we've, we've, if you ever get the chance to go to New York and famous Rockefeller Center, you know, now it's named the Comcast building and it's got its, you know, it's got its name chipped on the side of the, of the building and it's a, that's a nice thing to see every time I go to New York. That's awesome. We, we've had a, a few conversations with a number of alums who've been uh, involved in uh, the entrepreneurial space um, and, and involved in startups. And they, they talk about, you know, the need for innovative thinking and, and, and the ability to kind of bring different ideas. And a, in a large company like Comcast, can you talk a little bit about the, the importance of innovation and, and maybe even for our students that are listening of, you know, in a few years, some of them are going to be in entry level jobs and how they can kind of bring a, a sense of innovation or entrepreneurship to, to, to maybe some of the larger companies that, that they're a part of? Yeah, I mean, I think whether you are, you know, in a startup, you know, in a small location or whether you're an executive in a large company, I think you can think entrepreneurially. And what that means is like an owner that you're trying to build something, you're trying to move something forward and trying to develop something that is new that, you know, people will find valuable. So, Having that mindset of being an owner or an entrepreneur and trying to build something, I think is an important mindset in, in many areas, no matter how big the company is or how small the company is. Um, you know, we always used to have a saying, you know, in a large company like Comcast, are you an owner or a renter? And if you're a renter, and that means you're there for a short period of time and, you know, you're gonna leave at some point, then, you know, we're probably, we probably didn't wanna have that individual you know, be core to the company where 
if you're acting like an owner and you're thinking like an owner, then uh, that's the at least that's the culture we try to embody and have those people, you know, be leaders in our company. Hmm. That's a great it's a great analogy. I love the I love the uh, the imagery of that. Uh, well, one I mean, of our students. I'm going to use a real interesting analogy, maybe for your students, because some of them drive, some of them don't. But if you rent a bike and you're, you know, and you go to park your bike, you know, do you always put the kickstand nice? And if you get it gets in the mud and so forth. And if it's a rental, sometimes the person just like lets the lets the bike fall on the ground and sit there. It's a rental. It's not mine. Yet if you, you know, bought a brand new 12 speed bike and paid a lot of money for it and it was yours and you owned it. I think you're going to take a little bit better care of it than would your renter. And that's to me, that's the owner mentality. Sure. It gets wiped down after every ride and gets the pristine spot in the garage. Uh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. One of our students um, uh, question, Mike, you know, when, when you look at your role and where you are now today, look, looking back, uh, when you were at St. John's or even when you started in the working world, uh, was was seeking a large role at, at like a, a larger company like Comcast, something that you were was in the back of your mind or was it something that you kind of moved towards a goal or, or something that kind of uh, happened as you moved along? Um, you know, I, I always had goals and business was important to me. Uh, I always knew I liked business and was interested in business. And uh, I think in the back of my mind, I always wanted to go into business uh, kind of on my own or with a large company. So that was definitely a goal to get, more involved in the business community in the finance community and set some goals along the way now you know to me goals are are directional they put you on a path you got to appreciate there's going to be many forks along that path um but i i kind of picked the path i knew when i was certainly in college i went to babson college which is a, a undergraduate business school and that's because i knew that was a path i wanted to go to sure Babson's out. Uh, we've had quite a, uh, uh, we had, I think you're the third or fourth Babson alum and prep alum that's been a part of uh, Live Since You Asked um, over the last few weeks. So there's there's a, a big uh, a big kind of a continuum of prep to Babson grads. That's nice. Uh, nice to hear. Yeah. Can you talk about the work that you're doing now, Mike, with with the Kairos and and kind of the, the 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 investment side of things? Yeah. So I I started I left Comcast and. Uh, stayed as an advisor to them and then formed my own company called Ateros. I started about four and a half years ago. Um, I invested a bunch of my own personal savings in the company and Comcast invested, um, was really nice of them, invested a, a lot of money into Ateros. And that's all public. And um, we started hiring people, you know, four and a half, five years ago and building the company. And today we own nine businesses across the world. We have offices in London, New York, and Philadelphia. Uh, we are relatively small. We have 40 odd people that work at Ateros. We have about 26,000 employees across all of our companies. And we still have quite a bit of capital left to invest in, in additional businesses. So um, we focus mainly different than the venture capital folks that might have uh, spoken before. We tend to uh, make very large investments in companies that already exist. So I call them kind of in the in the middle in the middle cycle where they're profitable, they exist, and they really need capital to just grow the business larger than where they are already. Um, and that's been a lot of fun. Um, it's been very entrepreneurial. Uh, it's been great to be working with a bunch of entrepreneurs who built some of these companies over time. And our team, you know, focus on our team who. Um, has really executed really well in investing a fair amount of capital into these companies. When you're looking at, at, at different companies or, or even looking for, for new employees, what are the, the skills and the qualities that you're looking for in, in new employees? Um, you know, we're a pretty small organization and I have the benefit of being, um, you know, pretty selective in the folks that uh, work for the organization. When you start it, you can literally begin to handpick everyone in the company. And, and I think having, uh, I think an IQ in terms of their intelligence and capability is, is pretty much table stakes is that's just, that's expected. I think having a really appropriate EQ uh, is really important in terms of emotional intelligence and their ability to, you know, want to work as a team, their ability to collaborate, their ability to help lead and be an owner uh, in that mentality, have a bit of entrepreneurialism in their own spirit is really important. 
you know, we say if we found, you know, one of the smartest people, you know, we could, but they weren't the, they didn't have the personality fit in our culture, you know, we wouldn't hire them. Um, we need the really nice balance between, you know, high intelligence, high work ethic, you know, great capabilities on the professional side, and then really wanting to be a leader and a team player. Uh, and, you know, we've been fortunate enough to hire just a tremendous team that I think uh, has done really nice for us over the last four and a half years. That's great. Uh, one of our students um, is uh, asking you to go back to think about your, your high school days again. And as you look <laughs> back on your time at St. John's, uh, is there anything that you would have done differently or, or something you would have tried differently that you didn't try in high school, kind of reflecting backwards? Um, you know, when, when I was at St. John's, you know, I'm first to admit, I didn't take advantage of all the things that St. John's has to offer. Um, I wasn't involved in really that many clubs. I wasn't, I played uh, tennis on the tennis team, but I wasn't involved in many extracurricular activities. And now I'm a father and I've got kids who've gone through high school and see how they've done it. And I did, I actually did get very involved in areas like that in college. And I would just encourage kids that, you know, it's a really unique time in your life. Um, your parents have made a major commitment to send you to St. John's. Um, being involved in all these activities um, sometimes may feel like a pain or you don't really want to do it. But um, my experience with my children and even myself in college is uh, it's pretty rewarding and can't go back in time. But uh, my advice is make the most of your time there and uh, get as involved as you possibly can in all sorts of things. That's great. It's, uh, it resonates with what we tell our students all the time. So thanks for uh, thanks for adding that in. Um, Mike, this week we are, we're talking a lot about uh, Alumni Mentoring Week and our alumni team is working actively uh, in the virtual space to create mentoring relationships between some of our young alums and some of our, our current students on our alumni base. Uh, can you talk a little about any kind of mentor relationships you've had and, and, and people who've mentored you and, and maybe the other side of that of people that you've served as a, a mentor for as well? Yeah, you know, I, I think that I've been fortunate to have you know, probably three mentors in my life or career. Uh, but I think you got to go back to, you know, why would they want to mentor me? And, um, you know, I always have been, I think, a pretty hard worker and, you know, work is really a priority for me and, you know, happy to work weekends and happy to work late at night. And I think uh, folks who are much older than myself saw that in, in, were willing to take some risks on me. And I had a belief from my dad that the harder you work, the luckier you get. And um, uh, I got really lucky where, you know, very early on in my career, uh, a gentleman mentored me and uh, asked me if I would join his company, which I did. And as a really young guy, he said, I'd you know, like you to take some risks and I'll take some risks on you. And it gave me a lot more responsibility probably than I deserve for sure. Uh, but I think that um, when you start to accomplish things, people take notice and people notice that you're a hard worker and you're ambitious and uh, you want to do the right thing and you have high integrity and they're willing to mentor you. And again, I've been really, really fortunate to have three distinct ones over my career that um, I think have really influenced me and taken some major risks on me. Um, and I think I've seen, I've used that in the reverse way where young people that I've met, um, either that have worked for me in different organizations or I've gotten to know who are really hard workers and, you know, really dedicated to their personal and professional life. Um, those are the kinds that folks, at least for me, that I want to mentor. You want to put in amount of input that you see output as well. And uh, I've been delighted to have, you know, a few young young people who I've been happy to mentor and um, they're doing just great. And they're really high quality people, most importantly. That's great. Yeah, we're, we're really working hard to empower our students to kind of tap into the prep network and, and find mentors and find connections. So it's great to see how it's, it's benefited you and served you. And um, again, more sage advice of working hard and putting in the hours and developing the connections um, that, that are important for, for moving forward. Uh, we talked a little bit, Mike, before we came on. I was kind of sharing that you know one of the the themes that we've we've asked people to talk about is just uh, resiliency. Um, this is a pretty challenging time. Um, I'm sure in the the investment business and the in the financial business, and it's 
it's hard for our students as, as they shift from bricks and mortar to find motivation home on, on remote learning. Can you talk a little bit about you know the uh, you know the your experience of resiliency, the importance of resiliency, and um, how you see it you know impacting your world on a, on a day to day basis? Yeah, um, you know resiliency is a great word, um, and we all need to be resilient. Um, you know we tend in our companies think of a different word of maybe perseverance or persistence. You know resiliency comes to me at least my knee jerk reaction is and maybe use a football metaphor is you know the quarterback gets knocked down sacked and the whole whole goal of that quarterback is to get up that's a result that's a resilient effort my view is that quarterback not only needs to get up he needs to go to line of scrimmage and he needs to find a way to get that ball down the field and into the end zone and to me that's persistence that's perseverance that's not just getting up from getting knocked down or, or feeling like you're resilient with a crisis. It's like, how do you go forward? Um, and perseverance is, I think, a really, in a nice way, not in a jerky way, mm -hmm. uh, but in a really nice way, being having perseverance and persistence, uh, going after that goal, I think is, uh, and it can be a personal goal, it can be a professional goal, it can be a small goal, it can be a big goal, um, is I think really, really important. And we talk a lot about you know how, how do you persevere during difficult times um and i think that's a really important thing and you got to have a mindset part of it is having a goal to start with because sure. if if you're trying to get from you know uh using football if you're trying to get you know from here to the end zone that's a goal and you got to think about how do you get there how do you plan it and pers and you're never going to get there in a very easy fashion so you got to be persistent and thinking through that probably a little bit creative as well so uh, i do like the word resiliency i think it's really important um but i tend to like the word of being you know persistent a little bit better well, i appreciate the i appreciate the clarity i mean kind of a, a focus on you know kind of it's, it's uh, that what you're talking about kind of not just getting up but being focused on moving forward is really important um i think it's it's been i think for some of our students and from our faculty and staff it's been you know we have to get back we had to get back up when all of a sudden we close school and now we got to kind of move forward and continue with with the learning that we've been doing on a regular basis. Yeah. Um, one of our seniors, you, you've said a few different things, but one of our seniors who's, who's graduating um, is asking, you know, what advice do you have for seniors at St. John's Prep um, as they are, you know, about to to finish up their time at at, at the school and and move on to the world of uh, undergraduate studies? Um, well, obviously, you're a senior. You're going to start college. Um, you know, I believe that people need to, even young people and young adults, need to kind of manage their own lives. Uh, and what I mean by that is take responsibility for, you know, everything from their education to their decision making to ultimately their careers. So I'm big about how do you set goals? How do you think about what you want to do? How do you ask for advice? How do you build mentors? Um, so my advice is think about how you want to set some goals. Uh, they can be short-term goals uh, related to you know what's important to you. They can be personal goals. They can be more emotional, and they don't need to be business-like. They can be more emotional. You know, I always think about um, a number of things that are important to me in my life, and how do I get better at that? So, uh, but unless you really think about it and you know put it down in a piece of paper or put it on your iPhone and your notes. Um, you know, certain goals, then uh, then, then you kind of take responsibility for how do you manage it. I, I, I know every year January 1st comes along and we always think about New Year's resolutions. And it's, it's a lot of similarity to putting down a couple of New Year's resolutions. And then you got to take responsibility for how do you manage yourself to kind of hit those resolutions, whether it's I'm going to read, read books more frequently or I'm going to exercise more frequently or whatever the decision is it's really up to you to help manage that and one shouldn't be shy about asking for help to think through that one shouldn't be sh shy about asking for advice in terms of how do you go from you know putting it down on a piece of paper to trying to get there but i think you got to start somewhere and starting somewhere i think is just giving some thought to what's important to you over the next you know three months six months 12 months couple years 
I think one of the keys that you put out there, you know, just not being shy to ask for help is, is really key. Um, I think yeah. that, that's a, do you see that in, you know, in the world of, of, of Comcast and, and, and even in the investment world today, is it, is it easy for, for newer employees to ask for help or, or what, what, what motivates them to ask for help kind of when, when they need it? Yeah, it depends on the culture that you've set. So if you right. have a culture, <coughs> excuse me, that is open to that, um, then absolutely, you know, you have, you know, young folks coming in and asking for advice about a whole number of things. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we really encourage that. We encourage that mentorship and we encourage that advice. Uh, no one has every answer in the world. No one's always going to be right. Um, and, you know, go back to that team aspect. It's really all about the success of the team. So, therefore, you know, leaning on folks that you trust and you think are smart and can provide that advice is just um, should be as more natural than sometimes it is. Mike, the last question I'll, I'll put out to you is one of the, um, the two things that we've talked a lot about uh, with our students, um, my, myself and our principal, Keith Crowley, is really committing oneself to servant leadership. And the way we've, we've defined that is uh, influencing any situation we encounter for, for the benefit of others and, and kind of founding that on this commitment to advancing the common good. Um, as you've had your, your different experiences, can you talk about how you've seen um, effective servant leadership? Can you talk about how you've seen people uh, committed to, to advancing the common good and any insights on those, those subjects for our, for our students as, uh, um, as they look forward? Yeah, th that goes back Ed, to the um, comment I made about EQ, having that emotional aspect. Um, I think leaders have to have, you know, empathy and have to think about, you know, a situations that are a lot larger than where they are whether it's you know the school the community or the business and so forth and how how you can actually positively touch folks to um to influence them and and you know we all want to we all came to this world in some way we all want to leave it in a better place i think leaders have a real responsibility to as they make decisions think about what the impacts are and try to make sure that the positive impacts and the collateral impacts are pretty positive uh, to the community at large and, and who they're having discussions with. So that's why it's so important, at least from my personal perspective, that leaders have a you know high intelligence factor, but have a high emotional factor, because I think they're able to uh, positively influence lots of different areas, depending on what the focus is. Kind of tunes right in with our our commitment to educating the whole person and and really trying to develop all, all those different aspects. So I appreciate the the feedback, uh, Mike. I shared with you before, and he I was told that I had to share it publicly. Your your cousin, who's also your classmate, uh, called my office this morning to to make sure that I recognize that it's your birthday tomorrow. So happy birthday the day before. Thank you. And, uh, he must be very yeah. bored. And uh, <laughs> uh, in order to to call call the classroom, the good news is reading your emails. Um, there you go. You know, the bad news is we both were at the prep together. Um, we both graduated 82. Uh, he's six months younger than me, so I'm sure that was an incentive for you to make the call. But thank you for the birthday. <laughs> You're welcome. And, and Mike, you know, there's a lot going on in the world right now, and, and you've got a lot of professional responsibilities. We really appreciate you making time to, to talk to our students and to share some insights with, with prep alums. Uh, we know that time is at a premium, and, and we're really grateful for your willingness to share uh, your experiences, um, your your understandings, and, and really a, a lot of wisdom that, that really integrates well with what we're doing at St. John's on a day-to-day -day basis. So thank you for everything. My pleasure, my pleasure. Stay safe and stay well, Mike. Thank you. You too. Please, everyone, stay safe and well. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye.